Okay, welcome to our second video on Chaucer. There'll be one more after this. It's on Chaucer and genre. This video is on a topic that I touched on uh, toward the end of the last lecture, which is Chaucer's attitude toward the church of his day. This is an important point of contact with Dante. Both are in many ways exasperated by the church of their day. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how Chaucer levels his critique of the church. We're going to focus mainly on the general prologue still, because that's where most of the relevant material was found. We will also, however, incorporate the prologue to the, the partner's tale. Well, in the last video, we already talked about the monk. I used the monk as an example of how Chaucer uses irony, how he uses physical description, description of clothing, to try to telegraph to his reader what we ought to think about this person. And what we concluded was that the monk was not... Uh, really a spiritual person in the least, not really interested in the monastic life. Um, and so that, of course, doesn't reflect terribly well on the church, right? This is the one monk who is in this party, and he is not very spiritually inspiring. But what I want to do in, in, in the bulk of today's video is to talk about some of the other characters that we meet in the prologue, the general prologue, characters who are in some way professionally religious. And the picture we're going to get of the institutional church of Chaucer's day is not a pretty one. Um, let me briefly mention, I'm not going to go through this, but I'll briefly mention the nun. She's one of the first characters that we meet. The nun, I don't think we're supposed to despise or anything like that. But again, like the monk, she seems like someone who's not really interested in the religious life. She seems like someone who really belongs at court. And she sort of fantasizes about living that kind of life. So again, um, another sort of religious person and in the Middle Ages, this is what this is the word you would use to describe someone who had taken, a religious oath. They are the religious. So here's another religious person who doesn't really seem terribly committed to her vows, to the, to the way of life to which she had committed herself. But let me go on and say a bit more about the friar. The friar is someone who is presumably writing together with the monk. He's described right after the monk. And let me say a few things about this character that hopefully will allow you to understand Chaucer's description a bit more. We're told right away um, that he is a um, that he is a mendicant. Maybe we're not told that right away, but we're told that at one point that he was a mendicant. M-E-N-D-I-C-A-N-T. Um, a mendicant was a typically a friar who really had a kind of radical interpretation of the vow of poverty. Mendicants believed that um, they should not live uh, on, they should have no real, um, even communal property. Rather, friars should be supported by donations, by free will donations. And so uh, at least some of the friars would, would go around and, and literally beg for alms. Okay. Um, so uh, this friar is a mendicant, and most of the early friars in the medieval period were, in fact, mendicants. Franciscans would be a good example. Now, this particular friar uh, apparently, at least claims to have a special license from the Pope for hearing, uh, for, for absolution, which means 
that he was allowed to hear confessions. Okay? And again, I'll just direct you to Dr. Farmer's lecture on penance, which will walk you through um, what penance was comprised of in, in, in the Middle Ages. Con contrition, which is inward sorrow for one's sin, oral confession to a priest, and then a work of satisfaction. Um, so um, he was, at least allegedly, authorized to hear confessions and to grant absolution. So after the priest hears someone confess, the priest can then grant absolution, which means the priest says your sins are forgiven. Now, notice that the friar um, doesn't do this for free, right? If you look at page 9, about five lines down, sweetly he heard his penitence at shrift, shrift is, means confession, with pleasant absolution for a gift. Okay. He was an easy man in penance giving where he could hope to make a decent living. It's a sure sign that gifts are given to a poor order that a man's well shriven. Let me continue on. And should he give enough, he knew in verity the penitent repented in sincerity. For many a fellow was so hard of heart, he cannot weep for all his inward smart. Therefore, instead of weeping and of prayer, one should give silver for a poor friar's care. So in other words, he is turning this, he is turning confession into a uh, profit-making venture. He is making people pay for absolution. And what's even worse than that is that he's really downplaying the first element of penance, which is contrition. Right? The, the priest is not really supposed to grant someone absolution for their sins unless it seems that that person is, is truly sorrowful for his or her sins. But the friar is, is saying here, uh, you know, look, if, you, if you're not really that upset about your sins, that's fine. Just make a donation to me, and that will be how you express just how deeply sorry you are for your sins. So he's not only making money out of what ought to be a free sacrament, but he is not really encouraging people to experience true repentance for their sins. So, again, the narrator is not saying, oh, isn't this terrible that he's doing this? But we're supposed to read between the lines and realize that this is not the way confession is supposed to work. And he does go on to tell us, I mean, I think as the, as the description goes on, it becomes uh, more and more clear that we're not supposed to like this guy. Top of page 10. For though a widow mightn't have a shoe, so pleasant was his holy how'd you do, he got his farthing from her just the same before he left. So he's even willing to take money off of shoeless widows, right? So there's no real ambiguity there. This guy is uh, a bad egg. And there's a, there's a real irony to the way the friar goes about his business. Um, he won't actually associate with um, outcasts of society, lepers or slum dwellers, because again, they, they don't have anything to give him. They can't pay him for absolution. But he knows all the bartenders and the tavern owners very well. And at one point, Chaucer says he was the finest beggar of his batch. And that is a highly ironic statement, right? Because here is someone who is by his own religious profession, a beggar, yes, but he won't actually have anything to do with real beggars. He prefers the company of the well-to-do for a number of reasons, uh, but one of them being that they can compensate him for his religious efforts. And, and again, the, the, the whole impression we get of this guy is that he is so worldly, right? He wears snappy clothes. He dresses like a doctor or a pope. Um, 
He was a singer who played the hurdy-gurdy. He lisped when he spoke, so he had this sort of affected way of speaking. So the impression is here is someone who just wants to hang out with the wealthy, um, and that's about it. So again, here's somebody, because he's a friar, we know this, he's taken religious vows, religious vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Um, but if you look at the way he actually lives his life, um, he seems not to really have a spiritual bone in his body. Let me turn now to a, a different type of church figure, the summoner. This is page 20, general prologue. Now, the summoner, I have to say, uh, first of all, let's be clear on what a summoner is. A summoner is someone who sort of uh, brings defendants, sinners to trial um, before the ecclesiastical court. So the church actually had its own court system in the Middle Ages. And so if somebody had been uh, accused of breaking church law, the summoner would summon them and bring them to trial. So he works for the church. He's sort of an employee of the church, but he's not a professional religious in the same way as the nun or the monk or the friar. Um, I think the narrator here is unusually frank in his disgust regarding the summoner. And we get this First, I mean, first of all, simply from the physical description, he had carbuncles on his face, sort of big boils. He had black, scabby brows, a thin beard. Children were afraid when he appeared. This is never a good sign when children are afraid when someone appears. He's an imbecile who thinks he's kind of smart. He gets drunk and starts quoting all these Latin phrases, but he doesn't know what any of them mean. Now, if you just stopped there, maybe you could say, well, you know, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He's not easy on the eyes, but, um, but, but, but maybe that's the worst you could say. No, there is worse you can say about him because what he does is he goes around and he finds clergy who are sinning, living in sin, living with a concubine or something like that. And instead of bringing them to court, which is his job, what does he do? Um, let's look at this. Page 20, um, about a fourth from the bottom. Why he'd allow, just for a quart of wine, any good lad to keep a concubine a 12 month and dispense him altogether. And he had finches of his own to feather. And if he found some rascal with a maid, he would instruct him not to be afraid in such a case of the archdeacon's curse, unless the rascal's soul were in his purse, for in his purse the punishment should be. Okay, So he's going around, he's finding clergy with women, and by this time, Clerical celibacy was the norm, even though it was often more of an ideal than something that was that was always practiced. Um, so he finds these these clergymen with women and says, "Hey, you know, I'm the summoner. I could bring you to court, but if you've got a quart of wine or if you've got uh, some some coins, then I can look the other way." Okay. Um, and right after that, starting on page 21, the narrator really does show a sense of, um, uh, of scandal. He's scandalized by the, the behavior of the summoner. And again, this is uncommon candor from our narrator. But well, I know he lied in what he said. A curse should put a guilty man in dread. For curses kill, as shriving brings salvation. We should beware of excommunication. Okay? So excommunication, which is what he means by curse, excommunication is when you are basically expelled from the church, essentially. Um, this is a penalty that people should be afraid of, 
And that very fear of being excommunicated could, a- could actually be your salvation, right? Because you, you want to live right. You don't want to be excommunicated. But the summoner is basically going around and saying, no, you can live however you want. Just make sure you grease my palms and we'll be fine. So he is really, again, he's not a clergyman. He's not a religious, with a capital R. But he is possibly imperiling people's salvation. And the narrator um, is not, not, not using irony here. He is being quite sincere, I think, in his, in his outrage. Okay. Um, now we come finally to the pardoner. We get a description of the pardoner in the general prologue, and then we also get a, a fairly extensive prologue to his tale, in addition, of course, to the tale itself. So it's same page, page 21. Again, who is writing with whom? He is writing with the summoner. We know this, and not only that, but we're told that uh, they wrote together a bird from Charing Cross, Charing Cross is an is a area in London, a bird from Charing Cross of the same feather. So the summoner and the partner are birds of the same feather. Already we know that the partner is bad news. Okay, and Everything we're going to read from this point on will, in fact, bear that out. But before going on and talking uh, about uh, Chaucer's description here, I want to say a little bit more about his occupation. It's very important that you understand uh, what a partner is and what a pardon is. It's not only important for Chaucer, but it's also going to be important as we move along in the course. This is going to be a issue, an issue that does not go away. Uh, a pardoner is someone who sells pardons. Pardons are also called indulgences. And as we'll see very shortly, the Protestant Reformation, which is one of the most important events in Western history, the Protestant Reformation begins as a controversy over indulgences. It's really important to understand what they are. So let me say a little bit about their history. Um, indulgences really don't appear on, on the scene until about the late 11th century, starting with the Crusades. Uh, crusaders were promised a, an indulgence if they went and fought in, in the Holy Land and, and behaved honorably and so on. Um, now, the first thing to say about pardons or indulgences, again, they're synonymous things, um, is that they presuppose contrition and confession. So once again, I have to refer back to Dr. Farmer's lecture. Um, if you've already seen it, great. If not, I'll try to just cover this very briefly. Um, penance involves contrition, confession, satisfaction. I've already said that. Um, and the work, of, once you confess, as I said a moment ago, the priest then pronounces your absolution. The guilt of your sin is removed. Your sin is forgiven. However, there is a certain punishment that remains. Okay, So it's sort of like if one of my children writes all over the walls with a crayon, not that my kids would ever do anything like that. And then I catch them in the act and I scold them and then they're in tears and they say, I'm really, really, really sorry. I may say, I may say, I forgive you, right? And I, and I may mean that, but that's of course not the end of it, right? There's, there's going to be a punishment as well. And that, that's sort of the way that penance worked. Um, now, the, the particular act of satisfaction that is your, your punishment can take any number of forms. It could take the form, in fact, of going on a pilgrimage. It could take the form, as I said, of going on a crusade uh, or, or, or less dramatic things like attending a church dedication. Um, and so um, for, for doing one of those acts, you could receive an indulgence. An indulgence reduces punishment. Um, so it can help shave off some time in purgatory, for instance. 
Some indulgences were plenary, P-L-E-N-A-R-Y. Plenary means full. So if you got a plenary indulgence, it, it would mean that you could bypass purgatory altogether. So after you die, you go directly into, into heaven. Um, other indulgences were limited. So they reduced without entirely eliminating your time in purgatory. Um, so these were these were things that that were officially offered by the church um, and became part of church teaching. Uh, but as we'll see, indulgences are, are very much open to abuse. So a pardoner, one of the main things, the main thing a pardoner would do would be to grant indulgences, uh, pardons. But as we see in our example, there's a couple other things that a pardoner might do as well, like preach. And in fact, the pardoner's tale is actually simply the sermon that the pardoner preaches everywhere he goes. He really has just one sermon. It's, it's a pretty good one. Uh, finally, we learn from our particular partner anyway, the partners would sometimes sell relics. Uh, a relic is simply the uh, personal uh, remains, you know, a bone or something of a saint or a, a, a personal effect of a saint. So partners did more than just grant indulgences. All that said, now let's look at Chaucer's description of the partner. And of course, again, we know from the very beginning, we're not, we're not supposed to like this guy. Um, very worldly. We learned that very early on. He aimed at uh, writing in the, um, in the latest mode. Um, that's about two-thirds of the way down on 21. And um, yeah, I would just listen to this description here. Uh, but for a little cap, his head was bare, and he had bulging eyeballs like a hare. He sewed a holy relic on his cap. His wallet lay before him on his lap. So kind of like a, uh, you know, street musician with a little hat out for money. Um, brimful of pardons come from Rome, all hot. He had the same small voice a goat has got. His chin no, beer, no beard had harbored, nor would harbor. Smoother than ever was chin, chin was left by barber. I judge he was a gelding or a mare. Now, I think you all know what a mare is. Probably most of you know what a gelding is. It's a castrated horse, okay? So this is not real subtle. He is extremely effeminate, okay? Um, and uh, I think... I think for the narrator anyway, there's something about that that suggests his overall kind of uh, dishonesty. Now again, if you're still reading Chaucer naively, you may stumble, you may trip over a few lines. Like on page 22, about a third of the way down, the narrator says, but still to do him justice, first and last, in church, he was a noble ecclesiast. An ecclesiast would be a churchman. So you might think, oh my goodness, well, now the narrator is saying he, he was a noble churchman. But, but look carefully at the words, right? In church, he was a noble ecclesiast. In other words, when he's in a church setting, he puts on airs and projects this sort of aura of holiness. But that's just an act that he puts on in church. Now let's go on over to his actual prologue. He gives a lengthy prologue to the tale that he tells. And it's a little bit disarming because he is so candid about how dishonest he is and about how all he wants is um, money. That's it, right? Um, so he tells us he only has one sermon. And the sermon is based on 1 Timothy 6.10. You're given just the Latin, and it's not translated, so let me translate it for you. Um, the partner says, let's see if I can find the page number quickly. Partner says in his prologue, on page 243, on 243 he says, I use the same old text as bold as brass, radix malorum est cupiditas. 
The love of money is the root of evils. We know how much Chaucer loves irony. This is a supreme instance of it, right? He preaches all of his sermons against the love of money, but of course he's preaching precisely for or out of the love of money. He has absolutely no concern at all for the spiritual welfare of anybody, really including himself. Um, but again, he's so honest about this, it's almost a little bit, maybe not quite endearing, um, but it's hard to um, perhaps be as outraged as you might think he would be, just because um, in some ways he's not hypocritical, I guess. I mean, in some ways he is, but maybe in other ways he's not. Um, he also, you know, I, I um, uh, talked about how Pardner sold relics. He's no exception. And again, he is uh, quite frank about um, just how bogus his relics are. He's passing off a pillowcase as Mary's veil. Um, some of his so-called relics are really nothing more than lucky charms, right? So the shoulder bone of a sheep that belonged to a holy Jew, um, right? That's not really a relic. Or there's this magical mitten uh, that he says, if you sow your field wearing this mitten, it'll, you'll, you'll reap a great crop. Not really a relic, has no religious connection whatsoever. Um, so it does certainly make you wonder if he's really an authorized pardoner, if those pardons he carries around with him are really from Rome, right? Uh, but that question is never um, fully answered. Before I conclude, I have to point out, this is very important, I have to point out that for for Chaucer, there is a bright spot here. And this is, we're back in the general prologue. This is page 16. There's the description of a parson. A parson is just a kind of humble clergyman who um, supervises one congregation. Okay? Um, it's not a sexy position in the church by any means. And um, you read the description of the pardon, uh, of, the, of the parson and... Um, Incidentally, see how easy it is to get those mixed up, partner and parson, so make sure you get that right. Um, the parson, we're, we're given all this uh, uh, praise of the parson, right? He's a learned man who truly knew Christ's gospel and would preach it. And so because your irony detector is on, you're looking for that clue that suggests the parson isn't really what he seems, that he's kind of a scoundrel like the rest of them fact of the matter is, you never come to a detail like that, because this is a, a, a sincere, unironic description and celebration of the parson. He really takes his religious duties seriously, foregoes opportunities for making money so that he might take better care of his flock reaches the gospel, but he also lives the gospel. And so when towards the end of that description on page 17, when Chaucer says, I think there never was a better priest, for once we can just take that at face value. Okay. Um, also, one last point about the parson. I think a student pointed this out uh, a couple of years ago. It was a very astute point. There's no physical description of the Chaucer at all, uh, of the Chaucer, of the parson at all. There's no description of his facial features. There's no description of his clothing. None of that. And we've seen that for other characters, Chaucer goes into great detail to tell us what they look like, or how their voice sounded, or whatever. You get none of that here. That could be happenstance, but I think there's a, there's a deeper significance here. I, uh, significance. I think that it suggests that here is somebody who is simply not concerned with the external and the worldly, but rather with the internal and the spiritual. So for the parson himself, the exterior, the external, doesn't really 
matter. That's not what he's concerned with. He's concerned with the care of souls. So I have to think Chaucer knew what he was doing there. So to conclude, again, Chaucer in many ways is leveling a very similar critique of the church as Dante. Not only do they see a number of people at high levels of the church as being corrupt and basically unspiritual, but both see, I think, the root problem as greed. Greed and worldliness have infected the church almost, and I want to stress that word almost, to the point of the church's total corruption. Now, again, I say almost because there's no indication at all that either Dante or Chaucer simply gave up on the church entirely. But they don't pull any punches when it comes to just describing the church of their day as it actually is. Um, but you can't forget about the parson. The parson is is that one bright spot in in in, in a whole in a rogues gallery. He's really the only sort of person who is employed by the church who is described positively in the general prologue. And I think maybe what that suggests certainly suggests that the church is in sorry shape, but I think it also suggests that the church is not beyond some sort of redemption or salvaging if there are still people like the parson toiling in the vineyards. All right, that's it.